Hello, I'm super excited to introduce our speaker tonight. She's somebody I've worked with for what? How long has it been now? Mm, 15, 20 years? 17 years. Wow. It's been a long time. Linda and I first started working on Millside property back in 2002 when the when GP came to the Coastal Conservancy where I was working and said they wanted to sell us 400 acres in Fort Bragg. And I think I think at that point I was like, Fort Bragg, where's that? <laughs> <laughs> Linda was the community development director at that time, so she and I started working together on some of the planning, and it's just, so she's been one of the most visionary people we've had. We have lots more chairs. I mean, we have some more chairs. If you There's want to two. Run back again, There's like five back. chairs over two here. Two here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Linda then became city manager of the city, and, and as that, we worked even further on developing the Noya Center as a concept. So we worked together on really trying to see is that something that could work um, out there. And she was one of the people that was most visionary in helping to guide that process to see if that's something that we could do. So then when the blue whale washed ashore, <laughs> Linda was probably the first one I called and said, what do we do about this? And we agreed that it was something that would really be a feature exhibit for the Noyo Center. And if we're going to do that, let's try to get the Noyo Center going anyway. So you've been at the heart of everything, it seems like, that I've been involved in. <laughs> Absolutely one of my favorite people to work with in the world. Now she's in private practice, and your company's called, what is it I forget? North Coast Community Planning. North Coast right. Community Planning. <laughs> so she's got more work than she she can take, but we are, we still get her wise counsel on the Noyo Center um, all the time, and we hope we can get even more of it in the future. So Linda's going to walk us through some of the history of the mill site. So thank you all for coming. All right. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, this is actually one of my favorite topics to talk about, and since I left the city's employment a year and a half ago, I haven't talked about the mill site. And I actually had to like kind of catch up a little bit at the tail end about what's been happening on the planning. But I'm going to start out, if you just turn to the next slide, yeah. kind of in geologic time, and then really going leaps and bounds forward uh, to the present. My plan is to talk for like maybe 40 minutes and then just answer questions that you might have. Um, I know a lot of you here know an awful lot about the mill site, so um, hopefully I'm not repeating what you already know. Let's see, I'm gonna try and talk into a microphone here so that the video that's um, being made actually um, picks up my voice. So, there's two little, let's see if I can get my laser pointer to work. There's two little red arrows there. That's the mill site. And um, this beautiful map just came off of Google Earth, but I thought it, it really depicts just like the coastal terrace that is, you know, kind of where Fort Bragg is. Um, you know, this part of California is relatively young. It's um, three to four million years old. And as you know, the San Andreas Fault is about 20, 25 miles offshore here. And that's where the Pacific Plate goes under the North American Plate. And so, I mean, the interesting thing is I did a sea level rise study, um, or some research on sea level rise uh, for New York Harbor earlier this year. And it turns out that even as sea level rise is because of the tectonic uplift, um, our coast is rising too. So the impacts of sea level rise are going to be quite as bad here as in a lot of other areas. Um, next slide. So really, the history of the mill site starts with the Native Americans. And as you can see from this slide, I don't know how legible it is to you folks in the back, but right there is Fort Bragg. And as you can see, it's right kind of in the area, the northern Como, or in this area, the Coast Yuki, um, are north of there. The Native American people have uh, populated this section of coast for over 2,000 years. The northern Como are, you know, most of the Native Americans 
who live here in Fort Bragg, including those who actually still live on the mill site at the south end, are northern Como. They came over to the coast seasonally, traveled along the river, set up seasonal camps in the summer, collected um, shellfish, seaweed, and just enjoyed the, the coastal temperatures. The coast Yuki actually lived year-round on the coast. Um, so next slide. So these are just some photos that I pulled you know, off of the internet of um, the Northern Como. I like this photo because I think it is credibly a photo around Fort Bragg. If you look in the background, those hills look really like the little rolling foothills behind the mountains. Next slide. And this is a really lovely photo. It shows you know, a, a Pomo woman weaving a basket, a boy in the background with a little bow and arrow, and a, a cloth full of maybe acorns. I can't really tell what they are. But you know, the Pomo were hunters and gatherers. And this is just a horrifying shit. I'm sorry to include it. But, you know, but this is what happened when the white people came to the coast is there was just a lot of bloodshed and it's a really sad story. Um, and yeah, you know, there were, it, it just, yeah, it's just a, a really painful part of our past. So this map here shows the Mendocino Indian Reservation. The reservation was established in 1856 it only lasted for 10 years, and part of that was just that lumber industry came in and grew and grew, and it was much more expedient to um, get rid of the reservation. Initially, when it was set up, it was 25,000 acres. Um, it went from, this is like up by Avalovadaya, this is a 10 mile drainage here. And then, let's see, this is the Noyo River. It went down from like Avalo de Badaya to the Noyo River and then inland quite a ways. It encompassed 25,000 acres. And next slide. Um, you know, it had only been around for a couple of years when the military outpost was established here in Fort Bragg, hence the name of Fort Bragg. There actually was a fort at one time. Um, this is a picture of it, and it's interesting. I've never actually seen a photo of it, but you know, there it is. Um, it encompassed the area from basically the Sears Alley down to Purity, and then out to the mill site to kind of the eastern edge of the mill pond, and then back up to the Skunk Depot. So it's a fairly large area. But it was only in place, like I said, for 10 years um, when it was, it was vacated. And uh, next slide. And then a couple years later, the, um, the Indian, the Mendocino Indian Reservation was um, discontinued. And its lands were sold off for about 25 an acre. So bringing this back to the mill site, there actually were two Native American villages associated with the mill site. And this is all um, public information, so I'm not <laughs> telling you anything that's confidential and shouldn't be released. But one of them was located at the north end of the mill site, and it was called Indian Grove. And, um, and it was in the area um, just a kind of the flat area off the glass beach headlands and kind of, you know, just that whole north area. It's been obviously heavily disturbed um, by the activities. Initially, when the Union Lumber Company bought it, they, had, they put a nine-hole golf course out there at the, at the north end of the mill site. And then the, they actually owned the glass beach headlands to the north of that. And there was at one time a racetrack out there on that incredibly sensitive piece of land. Um, racetrack of what kind? Like horses? No, I, no, I think it was cars. Oh, cars. Yeah, 
I, you know, just kind of like over at the United Fairgrounds is kind of how I envision it. Um, and then at the south end of the mill site, there was another um, Native American settlement, and it actually was down on the river at, in the location where the, um, the Noyo Redwood Company mill had been. And so that's down kind of near the beach around the dredge spoil site. And that area, again, has been heavily disturbed. Um, and in the 1920s, the Army Corps of Engineers came in to do some harbor improvements. And I'm going to guess at that point that was the beginning of the jetty going out into the harbor. And at that point, the Native Americans who were living down there, it was just, it was two families, but they were extended families. And um, all the, the Indian Grove settlement had been, um, had been vacated. And so all, all the Native Americans, you know, who were associated with that area were living down at the Noyo village. And they were relocated up to the bluff of the mill site overlooking um, Noyo Bay and the location that they are to this day. So there's, there's about, I think there's five families out there. They're all kind of related in different ways. They're associated with the Sherwood Band of Pomo Indians um, whose tribal headquarters are over in Willits. And um, they have an interesting kind of land tenure. I'm going to move back here because the sun is just yeah, right that's bad. in my eyes. <laughs> um, so they, Georgia Pacific, when they moved them up to the mill site, they recorded a permanent easement um, that transfers to their heirs and successors. And interest, and it's all. It's it's been a little bit of a challenge for GP. I mean, they have tried to like buy them out, or you know, figure out how to get them off of that piece of land because that not only is it a really beautiful piece of land, but it makes it a little like GP doesn't want to own that Native American site in the forever. I mean, they would. Um, you know, prefer to just sell the whole mill site and um, never come to Fort Bragg again. <laughs> so, um, but but that's just that's their challenge because the the Native Americans do have a right um, to that to stay on that property and they have no interest in um, leaving it. That's they've lived there for uh, almost a hundred years at this point. Next slide. So this is kind of what, what happened when um, the logging started in this area. I mean, it was denuded. If you, I, I guess it's on the, the um, Mendocino Indian Reservation map. It's really interesting. It has, um, it, it, it's, it has a vegetation map <laughs> underneath it, you know, and it says, um, you know, brush and trees, you know, and rolling hills, and then, you know, the mountains. Like, it, it just narratively explains what was there. And in this area on the coastal terrace was brush and trees. And um, as you can see, it was pretty much denuded for, um, for development. Next slide. And this is what you know, prompted it. There are so many amazing slides of just the huge trees that were, um, you know, were fallen back at the turn of the century. And, um, you know, and that's really what put Fort Bragg on the map. So um, if you Go to the next slide here. I think I have, yeah, a little history here. So in 1885, so this is basically right around the time that the um, Indian Reservation is disbanding, C.R. Johnson and a couple of his partners moved their mill from the Ten Mile River down to Fort Bragg. And they did that to take advantage of the port at New York Harbor. 
And at that point, they um, incorporated it as the Fort Bragg Redwood Company. And just a few years later, um, Fort Bragg incorporated as a city. And C.R. Johnson was really, you know, the founding father. He he was the first mayor of the city. His partner in the Fort Bragg Redwood Company was um, Stewart, and I, I can't remember his first name, but. He was responsible for actually laying out the streets in Fort Bragg um, and did an amazing job, actually. <laughs> like, the grid really works, um, I think we'll say as a planner. Uh, so, um, yeah, in 1891, the Fort Bragg Redwood Company merged with uh, the Noya River Lumber Company and became the Union Lumber Company. And the Union Lumber Company uh, processed timber lumber on the mill site for um, almost, well, not 100 years, but uh, for a long time. Um, they created the, the California Western Railroad, which is the skunk train, um, again, to bring lumber out of the area. And then really, the, what um, just created the heyday for Fort Bragg is many of you probably know, was the 1906 earthquake. It pretty much um, demolished the town. What it was brick, and all the brick buildings fell down and all the wood bur buildings burned. But um, it was rebuilt within a year, and the you know, shipping of the redwood lumber down to San Francisco to rebuild the city um, ushered in a real era of prosperity to Fort Bragg. Next slide. So this is a picture of um, them loading lumber from a chute on the mill site down into a schooner. It's pretty amazing. So this this is looking across, this is in Noyo Bay and looking across um, at Puma Bluffs. I'm yeah. pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's in it says Noyo Harbor. Next picture. Oh, so these maps don't show up real well, but th there's a series of Sanborn maps that are the fire insurance maps. They go back to 1898 for Fort Bragg, and basically every 10 or 15 years, a new map is made, and it's really interesting because you can see kind of how buildings come and go. And with the mill site, you can really, they have incredible detail. Um, let's see, find this. Like in this area, right near, is this like, a, like very detailed um, description of how the mill operated and what equipment was there. But basically, I put this up here to show you like in 1898, these aren't exactly the same locations. I mean, this is the mill pond here, and this is the mill pond down here. But in 1898, the mill was pretty sparsely developed. And by 1919, you know, just 20 years later, it was very densely developed. It was full of rail lines um, and churning out an incredible amount of lumber. Next slide. So this is a view, I, I was not able to really figure out when it is, but this is looking at the wharf in, Shoulder, in Soldier Bay. And so if you're out on the coastal trail now at a low tide, you can still see some of the pilings from that wharf. And a lot of lumber was loaded you know, into the dog hole scooters. Um, in that bay, which is pretty incredible because also if you're out there at low tide, you will see it's a really rocky anchorage. Um, but here you can see, you know, just lots and lots of lumber being stored. Next slide. <coughs> okay, so now we're, we're gonna just do a, a great big jump. <laughs> so in 1969, the Union Lumber Company was purchased by Boise Cascade. And then, you know, just four years later, Boise Cascade was purchased by Georgia Pacific. And, um, 
you know, I, I checked that with a few different sources because it didn't quite ring right for me be, as a result of the, um, Dave's looking at me, the GP versus Office Max Super Fun lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> um, because Office Max bought Boise Cascade. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I maybe, think they bought this portion of the land. Maybe. That's, that's not how it's recorded in a lot of the history books. But so is Office Max owned by GP? No, Office Max um, bought oh, Boise Cascade, who basically retained the liability uh, for all the pollution uh, uh, caused by the Union Lumber Company. Boise did? What, uh, Boise did? Yeah, I mean, they, it, we'll talk a little more about that when we get to the remediation uh, part of this, um, of this slideshow. So um, at its peak, the mill produced a tremendous amount of lumber, 750,000 board feet a day. It employed 2,000 people, which is pretty incredible for a community this size. Um, by the time it closed down, like when it closed in 2002, 150 people lost their jobs. I mean, part of that was automation, um, but a lot of it was it had just, I mean, I, I think five or six months earlier it employed 500 people, but they, they were just going down to fewer and fewer shifts and um, just milling much less wood. So kind of the beginning of the end really coincides with the, um, the decline of our forest resources in Mendocino County. There was a period in the 1990s where the woods out here were harvested like they had never been harvested before. Um, and that could be the subject of a whole nother slideshow <laughs> of kind of what happened then and why, and you know, kind of the timber wars and how the reconciliation um, kind of came out of those between uh, environmentalists and the timber operators. But, you know, in 1999, Georgia Pacific divested of all of its timberlands in Mendocino County. It sold them to, um, I, think the, I think it was directly uh, yeah. to <laughs> Hawthorne. Oh, no, no. What? <laughs> the heck? <laughs> My 85 <laughs> might. Go about your business. <laughs> oh, did it fall out? I don't know what's going on. <laughs> mm. It's saying it's doing an update. Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> they do that. Ridiculous. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm going to just grab my laptop so I can see what I was going to say. And I'm just kind of slowly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I can sure. tell you what beautiful what pictures you're Where? missing. Oh, there you go. Yeah, no, do your thing. <laughs> There's nothing good happening yet. <laughs> I just went through that with my laptop, too. It's terrible. I don't know what's going on. This thing's getting old. Okay, let's see. Where are we? almost 200,000 acres of timberland. And um, in 2002, just three years later, they permanently closed the mill. And it, it was pretty, I, I was here then, I, Dave probably remembers this too, but a couple, like six months, eight months before they closed the mill, GP 
took out a full page ad in the Advocate News saying, we're here for the long run. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and it was just, it was really clear at that point that they weren't. They had <laughs> seasonal shutdowns. They, um, you know, they, they were milling less and less lumber. They actually, in the 90s, had to replace their mill. They had a mill that was they could handle really big logs, and there weren't any big logs left. <laughs> and so they, the mill number, whoops, <laughs> mill number one um, got replaced with the with a mill that could do smaller logs. Um, they closed it in 2002, and like very optimistically put it on the market. <laughs> Um, they were asking $24 million, and they, they hired, you know, C.B. Richard Ellis, a big commercial real estate firm, to, um, is it going to come back? It's possible. Let's <laughs> hope so. We're hoping to, to market the property. They had a couple of fights, but um, there was so much <coughs> uncertainty around the remediation, and what was required, and as it, you know, and, and nobody was going to buy the site and take responsibility for cleaning it up um, without knowing exactly what was there. And and I think based on the market response, GP realized that they um, needed to do more work to figure out, you know, to characterize the site, figure out what. Um, what was there. So, and and I'm going to talk a little bit about the remediation. The next couple of slides, if it does come back up, I want to come back to yeah. because they're really, I found this treasure trove of slides on, you know, kind of an old file from my Blackberry, <laughs> just to date it, of the mill site before the buildings had been torn down. And so I have a couple of slides with um, views from the crow's nest, which I thought would be interesting for those of you who work out there, and, um, and some other slides as well. You know, it's interesting as time passes by, just the image, like our recollection of that once really bustling industrial facility is gone. Oh, and I have some beautiful slides of the demolition. <laughs> I'm feeling, I'm feeling hopeful. <laughs> a really lovely slide of the demolition. I'm going to talk about the environmental remediation. There you go. Because in this, you're not missing anything. Right? This is just a slide of words to help prompt me. So as I said, when GP wasn't able to just offload the mill site for $24 million, um, they began a voluntary cleanup um, and you know hired consultants to characterize the site to do a phase one analysis to do a phase two the regional water quality control board was the oversight agency this was back in 2004 and um, the water board took it on because hey, look, there we go right, so if you just Forward. I'm trying. <laughs> uh, the water board took it on because they thought that it was primarily a petroleum site, um, you know, just based on the industrial practices. Okay, okay let's back up. Let me yeah. show you these yeah, yeah. slides because they're pretty cool. So back up one, one more. No, you were on this one. This is the one yeah. I was on. So next slide. Okay, so um, so this is. This is the mill pond here, and this was the hog fuel building where they stored it. They had a cogen power plant there. It was pretty cool. It made power not just for the mill, but it fed into the grid and helped to power Fort Bragg. Um, this was the sawdust right there, <laughs> getting lots of ocean spray and salt mist and all the chlorides that helped create the dioxins that actually became a problem. Um, and then that's the powerhouse back behind it. 
This was the planer mill, and then right over there was the main big mill. But the, this mill over there was new. The old mill was up in the area that's now the big parking lot behind the restroom um, off the coastal trail was the, the original mill. Um, and then this view is looking off of Johnson Point, down, straight down the runway, and you can see you know, the, the log decks before they, you know, anything had grown on them. And then, and then this is the mill here in the city's wastewater treatment plant. So the crow's nest is right about there, and this land right there is where the New York Center. And you should give me this beach. picture because when we talk with the architects, so the property that we have, the topography is, is very much like this, but that's because they had the long drying, drying beds for the wood, right? And then drainage between them. I mean, it's just, it, they, they keep saying that can't be the topography. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's actually the topography. It, it's, <laughs> totally, this shows it. it's totally man-made yeah, topography. Yeah, right. But what you also see from this picture is how poor the drainage is. Yeah. Mm -hmm down there. Um, but these pictures, actually maybe it's the next ones. Um, Wait a minute, so that over on that right side, is that, the, that's like, is that like a dirt pile that they're just <coughs> taking dirt from right there? Yeah. Like you know how there's that, there's that mound there, yeah. there now that's quite large. Yeah, it looks like so it's this is flat. the beautiful little peninsula. Yeah. And there is a mound, so they may have been hauling off um, like some stuff. You know, uh, the practice on the south end of the mill site was to clear the log decks by just pushing all the debris to the edges. It didn't necessarily get pushed into the ocean, but there were big mounds, and there still is a lot of that debris kind of under yeah. the meadows um, down there. And there was a lot hauled out of that area during the remediation, too, because they had been... Um, after they got shut down at McGuire Ranch, where they had been disposing of their fly ash, they, were, they just started burying it out here. Um, okay, so next, next slide. So this one um, is, is looking across the mill pond. Um, this is looking, at, looking across from the south, and you see the dry sheds up there, and this is, I think, the Hawfield building. It's kind of a weird angle. I think what I think where we are here is out on the beach burn, kind of or the roadway above the dam, looking looking back. Um, and the dry sheds here are really are the only buildings that remain on the mill site from the mill. And then this is the planer building here, which was right next to the mill, which was over here. Next slide. And then these are the two slides looking from, really from about where the crow's nest is. So this is the city's wastewater treatment plant, and then you see this huge looming mill behind it. And then um, I think some of this was associated with the powerhouse. Or actually, that might be the mill, too. And then this is looking across the bay, just turning a little bit to the west. And you can see these two, um, these were two storage buildings that were taken down. Another wood storage. I mean, there was a tremendous amount of warehousing, you know, acres and acres of buildings that were taken down. And then these two little things there are the dry shed. Again, okay. next slide. Okay, these are, this is the demolition started in 2008. And um, they received approvals to demolish almost every building there, um, except for the dry shed. This is uh, a picture taken looking down Maple Avenue. And this is the mill. It was an imposing structure. It came down in about three weeks. It was unbelievable. And they took all, at that point, there was the Chinese were buying um, metal like there was no tomorrow. They, took, they sold the equipment 
to the Chinese, and they recycled most of the materials, and a lot of it went over to China as well. So that was, this was the mill over here, and the planter building in there. And these were the kilns, the dry kilns, which were up kind of on the, on the embankment, kind of back behind the, um, the central restroom on the coastal trail. Up on that hill is where the dry kilns were located. And they had the most amazing, amazing redwood of any buildings on the mill site. It was a little darkened because of the heat, but the timbers were probably, you know, two feet by two feet. I mean, they were just massive, massive timbers. Did they get reclaimed? Um, yeah, I actually have a photo of a truck going down the street with a big, kind of ugly looking redwood timber, but massive <laughs> on it. Um, most of it got reclaimed. Some of the buildings, they knocked it down just for expediency. And the big, like some of the sheds and, and the beams just shattered when they um, hit the ground, which was really a shame. So you guys don't have to read this. This is, this is just for me to, um, to remind, to kind of get it straight about the remediation. So I was telling you that they started out with the water board. And then in 2006, like three years after their consultants had started, you know, doing the historical research and doing tests and trying to figure out what was where, Dioxin was discovered on the mill site. And um, dioxin, as most of you probably know, is a really, it's a really bad compound. It's a carcinogenic um, substance. It does not go away. That's really its problem. It bioaccumulates in the fat tissue of um, animals, and um, it's, it's bad news. They found dioxin in their fly ash piles. Why it took them three years, not quite sure. Um, but at that point, the community came unglued. I mean, we had just had our first fireworks display on the mill site. Like the community was invited out to view the fireworks from the mill site. Yeah, just as the dioxin had been discovered. And it was in some, the, most of the worst dioxin was in piles in, right, right next to the wetland um, that's, yeah, there's the forested area as you go along the highway and kind of Towards the north end of it, there was this wetland area, and they had a big pile of fly ash there. And it turns out, like GP, they did a lot of studies to try and figure out, like, well, whose dioxin is this? <laughs> and they did this, like, really um, technical kind of fingerprinting of the dioxins, is how it was explained to me, because there's a lot of different cogeners that form you know, dioxins, and they were, as it turns out, trying to see if maybe they could hang the blame on the dioxins on the burn dumps, like the three glass beaches that had existed along the, um, the coast. But one thing became clear pretty right on is that it, the worst of the worst dioxin in this big heap right next to that wetland, was from their period, I mean, they knew where that dioxin came from because they had recently put it there, and it was from this period when they were bringing in urban wood waste from the Bay Area and burning it at the powerhouse because they, they, didn't, they weren't generating sawdust from the mill, but they had these contracts with none other than Enron to sell <laughs> power during this period when we had the rolling brownouts here. And so they were, they had the big Schuster trucks coming up from the Bay Area with urban wood waste, which urban wood waste is like an acronym or a, a 
term for like junk. I mean, a lot of plywood stuff like that's full of formaldehyde and just nasty stuff, blues. Um, and it was getting chipped up and was uh, burned in the mill for probably a year, a year and a half. There was um, a pretty big community outcry at that time. And you know, the county air quality people came over and GP, and everyone was like, no worries, no worries. Well, I have to say, when, when they found the big pile of dioxin though, in the fly ash, and so the fly ash in the industrial process is basically what gets captured by the scrubbers in the smokestacks. Um, you know, and hopefully none of it goes out into the air. But, um, but so they, they had a problem. In 2006, they discovered, you know, that, that there was dioxin, not just in the fly ash that it came from that period, but that started a whole chain of events where they had been um, disposing of the fly ash at McGuire Ranch, which is up at the base of Bald Hill, and just tilling it into the fields because, like, that can actually be good, right? Maybe? Um, <laughs> anyways, they ended up doing a major remedial action up at McGuire Ranch and removing um, acres and acres of soil and, you know, bringing it down to a, a hauling it out to a dump down in the Bay Area. Um, they also had sold, like they would, they would bring fly ash to people. A lot of people had it in their gardens. The Mendocino High School had like, you know, fertilized its athletic field with fly ash. And so they ended up testing all over the place. McGuire Ranch was the only place that they were required to remove. Um, the material because the, uh, it, the, it was too high a level. So they had dust over it? What kind of material is it? It's like ash. Oh, ash. It's you know, just like what you would oh. scrape out of your right. fireplace. Right. Um, so at that point, the, um, the city decided to invoke its powers under the Polonco Redevelopment Act which was a piece of state legislation that allowed cities to basically um, take control of brownfield sites and over help oversee the remediation. Um, the council you know, adopted a resolution, gave GP the notice that they were putting the site under their Polanco authority and then entered into an environmental oversight agreement with the Department of Toxic Substances Control. So DTSC came in as the oversight agency once dioxin was found because that's, the water board doesn't deal with soil issues, they really deal with contamination of water issues. Um, and, and then, I, you know, so this all started in about 2003 was when the initial um, studies were done, and it went on, and it is still ongoing. <laughs> it's, um, it's been a slog. The, the city hired a environmental consultant to advise it and to really act as its um, advocate through the proceedings, um, which was really helpful. But there were countless community meetings, and people were rightfully concerned about you know, the toxic legacy that you know was left behind after a hundred years of industrial use on the site. And I think it's important to realize, like this is not just about you know Georgia Pacific big bad Coke Industries Corporation like you know polluting the land. I mean this. Our environmental ethics have changed tremendously over the last hundred years. And what was considered appropriate and acceptable even 50 years ago is not today. And, you know, I mean, the glass beaches are a perfect example of that. There were three locations along the coast of the mill site where 
the community drove out, dumped <coughs> their trucks, you know, burned whatever was, you know, on the edges, and it got pushed out. I mean, there was at one point even a, you know, a, a, a garbage company that collect, you know, went around and with its trucks and collected garbage from households that went out and disposed of its waste out there. So, um, you know, at any rate, it's, the, the mill site is now um, mostly cleaned up, and when I say cleaned up, it doesn't mean that there's no toxins left there. It means that it's been cleaned up to a level where for the most part, it is considered to be safe for future uses. There are some areas where, um, where toxins have been left in place, um, and they're you know, but they're they're not mobile, and they're you know basically capped, and that was considered okay. There are areas where there's groundwater contamination that the most cost-effective and way to address it is through just monitored natural attenuation, just waiting over time, testing, and um, the compounds will degrade. There are several areas on the mill site that are subject to land use covenants where, which restrict the types of uses that can, and activities that can occur on them in the future, like you can't put a daycare center right next to the dry shed in an area where there's still elevated um, lead levels underneath the, um, the pavement. So, uh, let's see. You know, one thing I will say, that this community is pretty amazing. So after the dioxin was discovered, I mean, DTSC, like, they listened to the community, and the community was like, you know, we are concerned, and we're concerned about the sea caves under the mill site, and, because there's big sea caves that extend under that um, property, and they were concerned about, like, whether toxins had leached into the sea caves. And so GP had to do a study of the sea caves. And they, you know, people were concerned about, like, has any of this gone offshore? And what about the sediments, you know, just off the shore? And GP had to do an offshore sediment study. It turns out our offshore environment is so turbulent that there really was um, nothing there. They, at one point, um, the Noyo Headlands Unified Design Group, their precursor was North Coast Action. And they brought Paul Stamets, who is this kind of crazy, brilliant scientist who um, has done a lot of work on bioremediation with mushrooms. And he came down here and talked to the community and got everyone all excited. And DTSC required GPS, GP to do a like a bench test study to look and see whether it was feasible to use um, the micro-remediation for the dioxins. Um, and what, what they found was not really, like it, it does bioremediate, but it just didn't bring it down to acceptable levels. So um, GP jumped through a lot of hoops. I, they have done literally thousands of samples out on the mill site. It's it like just pocked with samples like Swiss cheese. Um, they're still doing and will be doing you know, forever. Um, groundwater monitoring, uh, you know, there some, some wells are just reported annually, some are quarterly. Um, and the big unknown is really the, the mill pond, pond eight. And um, that there, is contamination in the sediments of Pond 8. It's uh, mostly heavy metals, but some dioxin, and they are um, still doing sediment sampling. They, I think GP thought that they were kind of 
on the final stretch that um, DTSC was going to allow them to leave it in place and just keep people out and protect it in perpetuity. And um, DTSC finally kind of got it that, like, actually, the Mill Pond Dam um, is not the most stable thing. It, I mean, the mill pond was dug out. It's not a natural body of water. It basically, you know, it diverted two drainages, one that came down from Alder Creek and one that came down kind of the Maple Street drainage, um, and put them kind of up in the headlands. So, uh, originally, you know, those drainages drained out kind of right where the powerhouse ended up being. And so they built, there's a crib wall on the north side of the, um, of the mill pond that holds it, and that's the least stable part of the mill pond, is actually that crib wall. So when you look at the bluff around the dam, it doesn't look that hot either. Yeah, there's a, a few really big timbers that are exposed with water dripping out from them um, at the top of the bluff, and then there's, um, you know, there's kind of the, the dam and spillway that's eroded around the edges. At any rate, DTSC got concerned about whether that mill pump was going to stay there forever. Um, GP had proposed some stabilization uh, measures for it, but um, I think they're, they're still looking at potentially having to um, do, you know, at least clean out some of the hot spots in the sediments there. So, um, just one last thing that I'd like to say about environmental remediation. This is tuning our own horn here, and I'm looking at Dave Turner because he was mayor. I was city manager when we were sued by GP. We were brought, the city of Fort Bragg was brought into their multi million dollar Superfund lawsuit um, on a cost recovery effort because the city's stormwater goes into, well, like 60% of it goes into the mill pond. And they were like, well, you know, some of those pollutants in the mill pond are yours. They came from this, and, and they're right. It's true. Um, you know, we never got to the apportionment phase <laughs> of the litigation. It was crazy, though. I, you know, fortunately, we found, um, we, we hired a um, insurance archaeologist, like if you can imagine such a weird and awful profession, <laughs> but, but this, this firm went through like old records and found two insurance policies from the 1950s that um, provided our defense. They had unlimited wow. defense. They had like policy limits of like if we had been, you know, had to pay, they would have paid. One of them was like fifty thousand dollars, and the other was a hundred. <laughs> you know, like nothing. But they they ended up paying about three million dollars in defense costs. And the city, and I will tell you how we got out of it. Um, first of all, our mayor Dave Turner at the time was a bulldog. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> that softy. <laughs> but we countersued. We filed a countersuit against GP, and it would have been heard here in Mendocino County Superior Court, and we sued them for fraud. Oh. And the fraud had to be reported on their financial statements, not something that you know, <laughs> our ministry wants. And uh, we, and we sued them because we, they deceived us. We actually found some um, documents that made it pretty clear that they were aware of the dioxin um, out there quite some time before it was revealed to the city. Wow. So, I mean, whether we would have won or not didn't really matter because <laughs> the, the whole thing settled as super fun lawsuits are um, prone to do. And this was actually cost recovery. This is when GP realized, oh my goodness. You know, they had, they probably, I would guess that they've spent 30 million plus on the remediation at this point. I think at that point it was 24 million, which was kind of ironic because that's what they wanted to sell the property for. <laughs> um, but but it's, it's, you know, 
as the clock ticks, it goes up. And they, um, anyways, at the end of the day, Office Max, who was the successor <coughs> of interest on the title to Boise Cascade and the Union Lumber Company, paid GP almost $15 million. Louisiana Pacific operated a little, um, I think, a pilot mill, <coughs> like just a little thing down on the south end for three years. And they paid one and a half million dollars. The city of Fort Bragg withdrew its suit. <laughs> we paid nothing. Um, but it really sucked up a tremendous amount of energy. It was just a, like a, a total waste of time. And, like kind of eliminated any goodwill that we had. <laughs> okay, so moving on. Um, planning. So now um, I want to do a time check here. Oh, shoot. Yeah, you're, you're running a little late. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, so this is actually, now we're really in like modern days, so you guys may be aware of this, but, you know, so the mill site, 430 acres, is this um, shows you've got, it's like a third of the land area in the city of Fort Bragg, and it's just an amazing opportunity for this city. In 2004, the city completed a mill site reuse plan, which was um, just a, a pretty visionary document. It had an economic development study and a community survey and an open space framework document and some initial um, land use planning and a market study. Um, and it was funded by the State Coastal Conservancy. Thank you, <laughs> Sheila. And, um, and out of that came really two main things. What did the community want? They wanted access to the coastline that they hadn't had access to for 100 years. And they wanted, and that's hence the coastal trail, and they also wanted like something that really took advantage of the coastal location and put Fort Bragg on the map, maybe something like the Monterey Bay Aquarium or a university, or, and out of that came the Noyo Center for Marine Science. So in 2005, the cities began negotiating with GP for the coastal trail. That transaction didn't close until 2011. It was unbelievably hard to get GP to sell the prime real estate on their property to the city. Plus, they ended up having to give us quite a bit of property that we basically said we can't pay for it because we would require you or any future developer to dedicate it um, with development. And so the city ended up acquiring 85 acres for the coastal trail. Um, and we did some initial uh, feasibility planning for the New York Center, kind of scaled down vision a little bit, um, figured out the best location, and in the very waning days of redevelopment, purchased 11 and a half acres out on the mill site for the New York Center for Marine Science. Um, at this point, the you know, Harvest Market last year acquired 15 acres on the mill site, and this year the skunk train closed on 70 acres. So there's, um, you know, development will eventually happen. Next slide. Out there, but there's a planning process that we need to go through first. The planning process starts locally and ends up at the um, State Coastal Commission. Donna Brown, see our local coastal commissioner is in the front row here. Um, so this was a this was the plan in 2018, and as you can see, a lot of it is green. That's all you know, open space and coastal trail and parkland. There's um, you know, big chunks like this is un unzoned. Up here, these are you know areas that would be I guess desig they were going to designate them urban reserve to just it's, it's changing fast. It is changing. Let's go to the next map. Uh -huh. I'll show you 2018 wow. or 2019. So this is in June, and things are looking a little different. This is reflecting the skunk trains purchase here, and so what they want to do is a bunch of residential. This 
this has to be light industrial because of the land use covenants over the area, kind of back behind the skunk train and um, where the dry sheds are. This is Redwood Avenue with some commercial, this pretty purple is visitor serving. Um, the skunk train has an idea of doing kind of a destination train hotel up there. Um, and then down here, there's kind of, this just got turned into a weird mishmash of um, light industrial and highway commercial. And here's the Noyo Center site. Okay, next, next slide. And then this is like kind of yet another version. This is more recent, and this is going to keep evolving. But this actually reveals the Sky Train's real plan, which um, is to bring a, um, an excursion train down that stops at their hotel and then goes and parks along the coast and they the train will have um, like camp these cars that are outfitted to be like hotel rooms and um, people it will be like get this little string of visitor accommodations um, right inside the coastal trail. Yeah. Is it so if you go by the coastal trail that we bike right now? Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the idea. It's the that so their idea. Yeah, the two, 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 two. <laughs> yeah. I no, I mean it, it would not be on the coastal trail property. It would be just inland from the coastal right. trail property. Um, we could hear it, right? Yeah, I mean I think the it would they would be moving very slow and yeah. it would be parked. Their their concept actually is it's kind of a cool con concept. So. <laughs> um, not, not necessarily this part, but they, they have this um, kind of glamping idea that's based on um, these, it's some trail in New Zealand that's very famous, I can't remember what it's called. Um, but basically you sell like the really high-end packages of, and they want to create a hiking trail along the skunk train route from Willits to Fort Bragg, which is pretty cool. But they, and their idea is, is that they would take people up to the top of the grade <laughs> and then let them hike down into Fort Bragg. And then this train would basically, it, it would be like a three night thing. And the first night the train, they leave all their stuff in the cars and the train moves to the next, uh, you know, siding where they, stay in the train, cars that have been turned into, and you know, have a fancy dinner or whatever. And then they end up in Fort Bragg along the coast. So, um, it would be nice for some people. But this is not a done deal. This is all just no. proposed. So if you yeah. don't like the idea, go to your city council meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is really, I just want to make a plug for like, the, here's a lot of people in this room, and I don't know, some of you probably do go to city council meetings on the mill site, but if you haven't been, go, stay involved. It's a really important piece of property for the future of this community, and it's a really exciting time because there are three major developers, if you will, who are interested in doing projects on the mill site. My favorite is the no yo <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's a second. So this, this area is the 15 acres that was bought by Harvest Market. And they really want a location that's on this side of the bridge. After they built, the, or you know, got Mendoza's down in Mendocino, the value of kind of being on that side of the bridge really diminished. And they don't own their store over there. They have leases and um, they would really like to just have a store right across the street from Safeway. Um, and they're, they're looking at um, maybe doing some housing with it too. And then, you know, and then the Sky Train has like a really big idea. But they just here. unveiled on Saturday, so people can go look at it. Yeah. Where do we go look at it? You go to the agenda for the oh, meeting. Okay. You can and pull up this. They said that they wouldn't have a lot of open space. I spoke to the gentleman who runs the sun thing right now over there. He said, you'll be surprised how much open space you're going to have. Yeah, well, I mean, if you look, there's a lot of green here. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, 
most of it corresponds to areas that are, um, you know, just jam-packed with cultural resources. So this is <laughs> what the city had and what the, what the skunk train proposed is nothing like this. It's a little bit like this, but it's, it's, lo it's more intense. So yeah. the previous one is what the skunk train? No, I don't or? have the most oh, recent okay. skunk train. The, the citizens here have to pay for all the infrastructure? No, 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 that's not how development happens. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, whoever wants to develop. Yeah, um, the skunk train, they don't take care of their own property. How are they going to, the property's a nest. How are they going to uh, expand out to the, to the so the meeting on Saturday, they talked about that a little bit. And the video has not been posted yet, but we've asked. I, I want to point out that the Harvest Market property actually goes from Cypress all the way up to Hazel. So the part that's for uh, highway commercial. I think this is, where's Hazel? So, right there. It's, it's, okay, so this is Cypress. Cypress and then Chestnut. And Chestnut. And then that's Maple. Maple. And then Hazel's up another block. So oh, they, really? Yeah, no. they have 15 no. minutes. No. Hazel, Hazel is half a block. This, half this way. way? Yeah. No, there. But you can see the firehouse. The white, white. I know. Madrone, the is, Madrone is the next block up from Maple. Um, Hazel, it is longer Hazel and skinnier is south than south of Maple. Okay. The, the, the track yeah. they bought is longer and skinnier than it's that. It's longer and skinnier. Than that yeah. one shows. Uh -huh. But it's a big piece of, of land, land. and yes. the north end of it has woods, potentially some wetlands. Oh, yeah. oh no, they definitely have riparian and yeah. and the entire forest. Right? They're not that though. You don't know. Right? No, no development proposal in the in the works yet, and. Um, I believe they want to give most of the woods to one of the nonprofits to manage, but they do want to. They do want to use some of it. If yeah. you go to the agenda for the twenty, the, the special city council meeting on the twenty-first, it will show the plans that were presented by Harvest and by the Skunk Train, which shows a much more nuanced versions of how they interpreted the zoning, which they said a lot of which was given to them, that they were told they had to build the residential. They had, if, when, once the video's posted, you'll see. They'll and talk, by talk just about. bad timing, our architects came Monday after the Saturday meeting <laughs> yeah. to give us our, our latest round of conceptual design. So if you haven't had a chance, we actually have them showing some of the preliminary designs, we're going to move some things around, but we have them in the dome, so make sure you stop by and wait and you see a few of the views of what we're proposing on our site. How long will that be available? Well, we're going to refine them and then we're going to put them in there to, to show all the time okay, so, so people can see them. Okay. Yeah, and we're also going to make a little um, model that will go out in the crow's nest so you can see an actual yeah, model of what we're trying to do. But it's really cool <coughs> if you go into the dome, it's like being inside of the dome. Yeah. So. <laughs> This actually has one more question. What's going to happen to the rest of the property that hasn't been sold? We don't know. It depends on QB. It does. Uh, they still own the property. So, anyways, um, I think that's. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I've definitely gone over. It's almost a quarter of. I'm happy to stick around and answer questions um, that any of you may have, and if you want to do it, however. I don't, I don't want to keep anyone here. I'm not <laughs> going to be insulted. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Pretty much forgot about this. <laughs> <laughs>